I hope you enjoy my stories. Instead of just clicking thumbs down, please comment and share how we can do better. If you do like our video then please like and subscribe. So, this happened to me at the pool today. And man, it was a bit of a doozy. I just wanted a chill day. You know, me and my son, we head over to our local pool because, why not? It's boiling outside, and a little dip sounded pretty darn good. I walk over to this shaded part because the sun is just too much, right? I'm all about being considerate, so I carefully set up our single chair to make sure I'm not hogging all the shade. Gotta leave some room for others. It's only fair since the pool decided to keep those chaise lounges locked up. People gotta bring their own stuff now, like chairs or towels, to sit on. I notice, though, there's like five towels spread out on the ground, taking up pretty much the entire shaded area. But here's the kicker. Nobody's using them. It's like they just put them there to claim the spot and then poof. Vanished. I'm thinking, okay, maybe they're coming back soon. So I don't make a big deal out of it. But after about an hour of these towels just lying there untouched, this woman walks up. And you can tell right off the bat, she's going to be trouble. Classic Karen. You know, Karen. With her snarky tone, is like, is this your chair? I was taking a break, laying in the sun with my kid and still keeping close to our stuff. I'm trying to listen to my podcast, not really catching everything she's saying, and I'm like, yes, do you need me to move it? Then she gets loud, says something snarky. I pull out my earbuds and I'm like, is there a problem? Your chair is not six feet away from us. What is wrong with you? What if I have a sick child? She practically yells. Now, it's on like Donkey Kong. I'm not one to back down, so I'm like, okay, Karen, then maybe you shouldn't be at the pool in the first place. And maybe think about not laying down five towels to hog all the shade and then not showing up for like an hour. She says something nasty back. But I'm over it. I'm trying to get back to my podcast. Chill out. But no, Karen's not having none of it. So, I, maybe not my finest moment, flip her the bird. And she's all, oh, that's a real nice gesture to use in front of your son. I'm showing my son how to stand up to bullies. You are a bully, I say. Standing my ground. Karen, she just shuts up. Doesn't say another word. But, okay, that's just the start of my day. After she stormed off, I thought, all right, cool, we can finally enjoy our day. But nope, the universe had other plans. My son decides it's the perfect time to showcase his newfound love for splashing. And, I mean, splashing everyone within a 10 foot radius. I'm trying to get him to dial it back, but kids, man, when they find something funny, there's no off switch. This other parent starts giving me the stink eye, like I'm doing it on purpose. And I'm like, hey, I'm really sorry. He's just excited, you know, trying to smooth things over. But this parent just huffs and moves away, muttering something about some people's kids. And if that's not enough, I forgot to bring sunscreen. Yep, rookie move. So now I'm borrowing from strangers, which is kind of embarrassing. And all the while, trying to keep an eye on my human hurricane of a child. Fast forward, and it's time to pack up. Now, I can't find one of our sandals. I'm looking everywhere, asking around, and nope, it's gone. Disappeared into the mysterious void where all lost pool toys and accessories go, I guess. By the time we get ready to leave, I'm just done. Exhausted, sunburnt despite the borrowed sunscreen, and one sandal short. But as we're walking out, my son, with his cheeky little smile, goes, this was the best day ever, dad. And just like that, all the craziness, the Karen encounter, the splashing drama, the lost sandal, it doesn't matter anymore. Because, despite everything, I made my kid happy. And that's what counts. So, yeah, that was my day at the pool. Felt like a comedy of errors at the time. But looking back, it's just another adventure with my little dude. And honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. But maybe, just maybe, next time, we'll skip the pool and hit the beach instead. Less chance of running into a Karen there, or so I hope. Ever since I started working at the hospital, it felt like I was thrust into an episode of a drama series you'd half watch on TV while scrolling through your phone. You know, the kind with quirky characters, unexpected plot twists, and those moments that make you snort with laughter or shake your head in disbelief. 
Amid those characters was one particularly memorable co-worker, the medical secretary, who, for the sake of this story, we'll call Karen. Now, Karen was a piece of work. From day one, she seemed to have it out for me, always dishing out gruff comments and condescending looks like they were going out of style. I couldn't figure out why. Maybe it was my face, or perhaps she just woke up deciding she needed a new nemesis. Either way, I did my best to steer clear of her, treating her with a wide berth as if she was surrounded by an invisible force field. Life at the hospital went on as usual, bustling corridors, the constant beeping of machines, and the daily shuffle of paperwork that seemed to grow like a never-ending mountain. Then, amidst this everyday chaos, I wrote a letter. It wasn't anything scandalous or controversial, at least that's what I thought. The letter, sent to our local newspaper, was my two cents on the state of our economy. It suggested that perhaps it might be wise for both unions and the government to negotiate wage increases more in line with our economic reality. You know, a share the pain approach to ensure everyone got through tough times together. Seemed reasonable enough, right? Well, Karen didn't think so. When she got wind of my letter, it was as if I had personally declared war on her. She launched a campaign against me that would make any political strategist dizzy. There were demands to the union that I be censored, fined, and reprimanded in all sorts of ways. I could almost imagine her, nose in the air, stomping down the corridors, rallying for my head on a silver platter. I wouldn't have been surprised if she was trying to get me fired behind the scenes, whispering in ears, and painting me as some union traitor. The odd part? No one else seemed to care about my letter. There were no outrage letters to the editor, no side eyes in the hallway, nothing. It was business as usual for everyone but Karen. However, in her quest to see me punished, it was suggested, likely in an effort to calm the stormy seas she was whipping up, that I write a letter of apology. So, I did, but it was the kind of apology that was dripping with the irony of apologizing for exercising my right to free speech. A sorry not sorry that you almost want a frame because it's so beautifully passive-aggressive. When Karen received that letter, it was like watching a volcano erupt. She charged down to my office, fury in her eyes and words flying faster than I could register. The letter, crumpled and hated, was thrown at me as she declared my apology unacceptable. The spectacle was something to behold, earning wide eyes and dropped jaws from anyone in the vicinity. Despite her performance, no one, including her union, supported her vendetta. There was my apology, on file, and as far as they were concerned, that was the end of it. After that, things went relatively back to normal, or as normal as they can be in a hospital setting. Karen remained as pleasant as a sandpaper handshake but eventually directed her energy elsewhere, possibly realizing her campaign against me was going nowhere. Years rolled by, and dramas of all sorts unfolded in the halls of our hospital, yet nothing quite matched the intensity of my spat with Karen. When I heard she had retired, part of me was relieved. No more dodging, no more snide remarks. But then, not long after her retirement, the news came through that she had passed away from a heart attack, alone. Despite our differences, that hit me harder than I expected. It was a stark reminder of how quickly things can change, of the brevity of life, and how sometimes, we get so wound up in our battles that we forget what's truly important. Reflecting on those turbulent times with Karen, I found a strange sort of understanding. Maybe she was fighting her battles, personal wars we knew nothing about. Perhaps the hospital dramas, the conflicts, and all the chaos were just distractions from whatever was really going on with her. It's a weird thought, but it brings me a sense of peace. A resolution to a chapter in my life that was filled with more conflict than camaraderie. Life goes on, lessons are learned, and the people we cross paths with, no matter how challenging, teach us something about ourselves and the world around us. In the end, I guess Karen did me a favor. She taught me resilience the importance of standing up for what you believe in, and the art of crafting a killer apology letter, even when you're not entirely sorry. It's funny how things turn out, how adversaries can teach you more about yourself than friends sometimes. So, here's to Karen, the unlikely teacher, and a reminder that every interaction, good or bad, shapes us in ways we might never expect. Okay, boys and girls, this is like a typical day for me at the call center. So, I've been working at this call center for a while, you know, the one that gives out government assistance phones. 
It's an alright job. Don't get me wrong. It can get super repetitive and exhausting, but at the end of the day, it feels good helping out folks who really need it. These phones, they're a lifeline for some people. Without them, they wouldn't be able to make a doctor's appointment or call for help in an emergency. They get these phones for free if they're on Medicaid, Medicare, EBT, or something similar. And with it, they get like 60 or maybe 90 free minutes every month. So there I was, doing my usual thing, which is basically everything. From helping people buy extra minutes, showing them how to activate their phones, to doing some troubleshooting, or even handing out emergency minutes. I even guide folks on where they can go to sign up for these phones. It was a normal day, not too hectic but steady enough to keep me on my toes. Then came my next call, the one that still makes me shake my head when I think about it. For the sake of the story, let's call the caller Karen. Karen needed to update her IMEI number because she got a new phone. That's a pretty standard procedure. I started off by guiding her on where to find the necessary numbers and asked her to let me know once she had them ready so she could read them out to me. After a bit of silence, which felt like forever given we were supposed to keep our calls short and sweet, I gently asked her if she had found the numbers. Boy, was that a mistake. Karen blew up like a firecracker on the 4th of July. She starts berating me, calling me all sorts of names and demanding I go back to my home country, using some pretty nasty slangs aimed at Hispanics. Now, I'm from Texas and not Hispanic, but that didn't matter. Her words were vile and uncalled for. It was shocking, to say the least. The more Karen ranted, the more unreasonable she sounded. She even went as far to demand an American supervisor because she couldn't stand my Mexican a -asters. The irony of it all was just mind-boggling. So, what did I do? I remembered one of my buddies at work. Let's call him Jose. He's been around the block. Knows how to handle these types of calls. He's not exactly a supervisor, but close enough. Plus, and here's the kicker, he's Hispanic. After I filled him in on Karen's tirade, he took over the call without skipping a beat. Karen, oh Karen, she didn't know what hit her. Jose put her in her place, warning her that her behavior could lead to her phone being shut off. He even went as far to tell her to shut up and listen, which, knowing Jose, was more polite than Karen deserved. Despite even that, Karen kept complaining about how I was the one at fault. The moral of the story? Don't be like Karen. It gets you nowhere. And honestly, it just makes for a bad day for everyone involved. No one, I mean no one, likes a Karen. And before anyone gets upset, no shade to the nice Karens out there, you know who you are. I've got loads more stories from my time at the call center, tales that would make you laugh, shake your head, or even drop your jaw in disbelief. The kinds of stories that make you wonder about humanity sometimes. But those tales are for another day. For now, just remember, kindness goes a long way, especially when you're on the other end of the phone. However, my day isn't over yet, so. So there I was again, facing the wrath of Karen over the phone. It seemed like my call center days were incomplete without crossing paths with at least one Karen a day. And today was no different. Well, a normal day I get one, but today was special, so here's the second one. This time, another Karen had a new issue, a $20 phone card debacle. It started with Karen informing me that they had purchased a phone card from a gas station, only to realize, too late, that the card was of no use to them. Now, anyone who's worked in customer service knows that the first thing you check is the refund policy. And Karen, despite their, let's say, unique approach to situations, had done just that. They knew our policy, no refunds on cards. But here they were, wanting exactly that. I could already imagine Karen standing in the gas station, the cashier explaining the no refund policy on phone cards, and Karen deciding that their next battle would be with us. So they called, and the unfortunate soul to pick up was me. With the patience of a saint, or so I thought, I explained our refund policy. Not once, not twice, but five times. Our systems were pretty clear. No refunds on physical cards. No exceptions. We could cancel services like an unwanted upgraded phone plan, sure, but refunding a physical card. That was out of our hands. Once those minutes are added to an account, they might as well be set in stone. You'd think that would be the end of it, right? Oh, how wrong I was. Karen's frustration quickly turned into anger, and before I knew it, they launched into a tirade about how it was our fault for not making the phone cards compatible with other service providers. Their voice kept rising, their arguments becoming more far-fetched. 
blaming us for their failure to read compatibility details. And then, the question that seemed like a desperate search for a solution. What do I do with a $20 card I can't use? So, I did what any reasonable person would. I offered a suggestion. Maybe try to sell it to someone who uses our service? Perhaps a friend or someone online? Apparently, that was the wrong thing to say. Karen's response was immediate and loud enough that I had to pull the phone away from my ear. Accusing me of insinuating they were too poor because they used a government-assisted phone plan. That was not what I meant, not even close. But try telling that to Karen. No! Before I could get a word in, they demanded a manager. I unders, I started. Manager, they snapped back, cutting me off. And so, with a heavy heart and an even heavier hand, I transferred the call to a lead agent. Not someone I was close with, just another employee doing their time in the customer service trenches. What happened after that, I can only guess. I imagined Karen unleashing their frustration on my unsuspecting colleague, a scenario I didn't envy. The rest of the day was a blur of calls and the usual customer service routine, but Karen's call lingered in my mind. It wasn't about the $20 or the wrongly purchased card. It was about the gap between policy and human frustration, a chasm I found myself bridging daily. Days turned into weeks, and the call center life continued in its usual ebb and flow. I'd faced many Karens before, and I'd faced many after. Each call was a story, sometimes frustrating, occasionally hilarious, and once in a while, surprisingly heartwarming. But that day, with Karen on the line, was a reminder of the unpredictable chaos that is customer service. As I clocked out, I couldn't help but wonder about Karen. Did they ever sell that phone card? Did they find a friend eager for a $20 top-up? Or did the card get forgotten, buried under a pile of similar, unresolved grievances? I guess I'll never know. Working in a call center, you learn to navigate the highs and lows the angry customers, and the occasional Karen. You learn that for every frustrating call, there is a chance to offer a solution, to help, or at least to listen. And as I made my way home, I realized that, despite the challenges, I was looking forward to what tomorrow's calls would bring. Because in the world of customer service, you never know what's waiting for you on the other end of the line. I would like to thank you for watching the video to the end. To encourage us to make more videos, please like, subscribe, comment, as well as share. Check out this other video if you haven't already.